<laughs> right, hand it over to you, Cheryl. Okay, lovely. How's everyone doing? Good. Yeah, did you enjoy that performance? Yeah. It was nice, wasn't it? All right, so I'm Cheryl, and I'm one of the moderators on the panel this afternoon. So we have six amazing individuals here. I'm going to introduce, I'm just going to run through a real quick introduction, and then we're going to jump straight into it because time is definitely of the yeah. essence. So to my left, we have. I'm going to refer to my notes so I don't, you know. Okay, we have Adrian Sykes, host of Did You Know podcast, founder of Decisive Management. Please put your hands together for Adrian. <laughs> Beside Adrian, we have Justin Gaddy. Gaddy? Gaddy. <laughs> All right. Uh, founder and of Young Music Boss. Please put your hands together for Justin. <laughs> Beside Jasna, we have Universal Music a and exec, Ree Cyril. Please put your hands together for Ree. And down a bit, we have... Who have we got down next to Ree? We have Michael. I know, I'm just trying to run through and grab Michael's DL. I'm just kind of buying some time. We have the legend that is Michael Riley. Please put your hands together. Sorry, what was that, Michael? I'm clapping myself. Of course, you've got to clap yourself. You've got to clap yourself. Michael is a senior lecturer, director for the Black Music Research Unit, principal investigator for base culture research at the University of Westminster, and is one of the founding members of the British Roots reggae band, Steel Pulse. Yeah. Just so you know. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right. <laughs> we have another person on the panel. We have... Professor of Criminology and Sociology, course leader for the new MA Global Black Studies at University of West London, writer and poet, aka dancehall DJ Leslie Lyrics. Please put your hands together for Professor William Henry, aka Les. All right. And last but by no means least, we have my co -moder -mod moderator. At the end there, this is the amazing Roger Wilson, founder of the Black Lives in Music Report. Mm. Everything. Everything. Everything Black Lives in Music Report. So please put your hands up for him. All right. So, Roger, I think it's only right we kind of start with you. If you could just let people know a little bit about Black Lives in Music and what, what it's all about. Yeah, sure. Um, I was really worried, I have to say, after um, being introduced after Professor Les, it was kind of... It was a big one, wasn't it? It was pretty impressive, right? <laughs> no, it's an honour to be here. Thank you. Um, so Black Lives in Music, it, um, it's an organisation. It is um, something that really started with my experience and co-founder, Cherise Beaumont. We've both been in the music industry for over 30 plus years. Um, and... I certainly have seen it from a lot of different angles. So I've been a musician um, working across the industry for a good 20 plus years. I've been an uh, artist manager. I've been a tour manager. I've been an orchestra manager. Uh, 32 years I've been an instrumental teacher as well at all levels from, uh, from uh, ground up from uh, prep school, primary school, right up to higher education. And I think through all of those 30 odd years I've seen a real paucity of colour in every single thing that I've done, uh, whether it's been a musician working with orchestras, I think Four Strings was just about to allude to how tricky it is to become a musician doing those eight grades and then going on to music college and um, becoming a professional. And if that isn't hard enough, uh, you have to do it while you look a bit like me um, and my fellow colleagues on the panel. And that is not without difficulties um, that are there. Um, I've. I'm here, basically, um, despite the obstacles that I've negotiated along the way, not because of the, the support that I've had. And Black Lives in Music um, is, is an organisation that really wants to be part of the narrative. We are not the answer. Um, we are not the silver bullet. We just want to be part of that narrative to support change. Uh, we're championing um, developing talent, emerging, emerging talent. Um, we're supporting at grassroots level. Uh, and we're also talking about it from an informed p position as well. So that in involves uh, a re our report. So last year we brought out a report on being black in the United Kingdom industry, which was about um, black music creators and ind industry professionals. And it was groundbreaking. Why? Because no one has bothered to want to find out what it's like to be black working in our industry. Um, we produced a lot of really key information that for, I think, anyone on this panel, you will be very um, 
unsurprised by it. Why? Because it is our lives. But for many people out there, they're pretty shocked and there was a lot of engagement with this. So um, that data is quite interesting because Cerise, my, um, my colleague and co-founder, um, said, we've got to do data, we've got to do a report. And I was like, well, what do we need to do a report for? We, what, what do we need data to find out that there are like, hardly any black people working in, in, in the industry in, in, with the opportunities that they should have? But actually that report was really, really quite engaging with a wider, um, a wider community in the in industry sector. So we're really proud of the work that we do and we're continuing um, that. We're very also proud to have support from people like Michael Riley. So um, yes, I'm just public shout out to Michael. Thank you. You're definitely in awe, Roger. Definitely. Okay, so we're talking about racism in the, in the music industry. And I guess the first question has to be, do you guys feel that the industry is institutionally racist? Yes. <laughs> Re jump straight in. Amen yeah. to that. Okay, Re, why, why do you sort of say that with so much, well, just there's no wavering. It's just yes, there's no, nothing else behind it. Because um, <clears throat> I think, like, I work for Universal, and when I go in the building, thankfully now, there's, like, obviously a lot of people that hate... I actually kind of hate this phrase, like, look like me. There's a lot of black people. And it's still in, like, relation to how many people that aren't black. We're just, a, like, a dip in a pot, like a stone in a pond. It's just very... Yeah, it's just very sparse. So is it that there's not many people that kind of represent us? Is that why? Yeah, like, I mean, I don't want to say represent us. There's loads of people that represent us. Um, it's just, are they in my building? No. Right. So it's like, yes, it's institutionally racist because otherwise there'll be a lot more fairer or I'd see a good balance in my building. Um, the artists that we're championing, a lot of them are black. A lot of them that are charting are black. And the people that are working at campaigns aren't. So, yeah. So it's a bit of a contradiction. Yeah, so it's like... Well, it must be because why else isn't why else aren't we in the building in numbers that are making them numbers? Yeah. So yeah. So I'd say yeah. I hear that. Anybody else want to add to that? How long we got? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, greetings everyone. <laughs> greetings everyone. Greetings. greetings. Yeah, we should greet each other because it's our reasoning. For me, it's not even a question of if. It is institutionally racist. It's institutionally racist, systemically racist, because if you're black, and you know, Michael is one of the crucial people to speak on this as well as my brother here, but if you're in any aspect of this society, because what underpins the society is institutionally racist, classes, and sexist, you're going to feel it. And if you if you're black of African ancestry, however you want to style yourself, you're going to feel it more because globally we are at the bottom of the human ladder. Wow. Doesn't matter where we are, okay? So if you think about that in the context of being here, in what I call the womb of a scornful mother country, because I was born in Lewisham, right. and someone told me to go home about a month ago. So I mean, I know him, I tell him I forgot. <laughs> but they're telling me to go home, some white dude. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? That just shows you how the society is structurally racist. Therefore, why are we surprised that all the institutions are? So a very quick thing about music, because as we get into it, I really want to focus on radio stations. Okay. Because we could produce as much music as we want. If the radio stations don't air it, we're done. Pointless, yeah. Although it's not as crucial now because you can do podcasts and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But when I was really in music, let's say 1982 to about, I don't know, 94, when I decided to do this kind of stuff but the point I'm making is this and again Michael is best place to say this you will never find go through the music charts of the 80s and 90s you will never find more than two or three black performers from the UK in a national chart at the same time wow. they will never release more than two singles because if they release three they have to do another album isn't it Michael there are all these things that are structurally and strategically against us then you've got recognition on the radio stations so in two and i'll finish very quickly but in 2006 we did a youth engagement project michael was on it we had fifth uh, about a dozen young people aged what well, was supposed to be 15 to 18 but my little daughter was 12 so she was on it but what they did was they interviewed people from the music business like michael maccabee maxi priest loads of people papa levi loads of people and the commonality was 
They never got more than one album deal. None of them. From the mainstream record companies. And in fact, Asher Senator, and he's on the film, you could probably find it online, it's called True Reggae Story, T-R-U Reggae Story. Asher Senator said that they were helping, I can't remember it was, it was a, a British duo, a bit like Chakademus and Pliers, a bit like them. And they sold more than Chakademus and Pliers. And when they approached radio stations like Capital, Radio One, whoever the hell else was there, they said, we only support one at a time. It's on record, it's not hidden. So let's not say if, because it is. Yeah. Okay. Can I just put this into of context? Course. I just want to thank Les for that. Um, you're all aware of Radio One, yeah? But do you know how Radio One came about? Radio One, in I think it was the back end of 1964, is the byproduct of Radio Caroline. We're talking about pirates. Yeah, Caroline. Radio Caroline was the most successful pirate radio station in the UK in the 60s. Around about 64, the beginning of 64, it had in excess of 20 million listeners. This is pirate radio playing mostly American R&B, bits of Calypso, bits of reggae. The government took umbrage with this. One, because it was about British youth and what they were getting into. Um, the other thing was this idea that they were not in control. This was a pirate radio on a boat just off the coast uh, to get out of uh, British waters. Anyway, sh long story short, uh, the government colluded with the BBC. They closed down Radio Caroline in an effort to uh, curate black music on radio and the music that young people are listening to in the UK. And about four months later, created Radio One. They took key DJs from the pirate radio, including uh, Tony Blackburn, Tony Blackburn right Emperor Roscoe, yeah. um, and a few others, and created David Radio, Travis, David Lee's Travis. Travis. Yeah. These are people that you'd call old people now, but. <laughs> um, the point is, this is the birth of Radio One. It's a curation of the most popular music in the UK in the 60s, which was black American music and bits of Caribbean music. I just want to put that in there for context. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, on, like, I mean, is, is the music industry racist? Like, it's just undeniable and it's from so many different like angles like in terms of like the executive and how power is distributed and people who hold positions of influence in in a system which like exploits and benefits so much from black music and black creativity to the silence that we see with you know um, music entities as far as like things that happen within society and how they can use their influence and power and also in terms of like, the distribution of wealth for black artists and black creatives and how all of that comes together and, it, and it's, it's deliberate um, and I, I guess now we're in, a, in a, an era where we have access to information we have access we, we have the ability to claim some of that power back. So these conversations are very important and also taking that responsibility to educate yourself, empower yourself and challenge these things is also very important um, outside of just, um, I think now, sorry, it's not COVID, okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's not COVID. Yeah. Just put it out there. And everyone's like, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think, yeah. So, I, and I think that we, it, it, we are at a place where, yeah, it's important to continue exposing this and continue challenging this, but we also, we're also at a place where we're in a position to take some level of responsibility in terms of how we're going to change that narrative and how we're going to um, shift the landscape. And I think it's very important to, to speak of that as well. So how are we doing that? Then what are some of the ways that um, we are doing that? Well, BLIM mm -hmm. is an example of that because I think that gathering um, data is very important because expo it exposes things and it challenges things and it, it, puts, it puts hard facts in the faces of you know like the powers that be mm -hmm. and it makes it um yeah it, it exposes it so i think that that's a starting point but also in terms of like as you know black creatives as black entrepreneurs um you know really announcing ourselves and pronouncing ourselves in terms of like what our value is and what we contribute um and not like for example i run young music boss and it's very easy to um get um, caught up in like the like you know you might receive an email from Sony or an email from Universal that want to work with you um, 
and um, it's about standing your, um, your ground and, like I said, asserting your value and saying, guess what? This is what I charge for my time. Guess what? This is what it costs to access my network. I'm not moving. Guess what? This is what the value that I place in, on my network. And you're going to have to come with, num with, with numbers to talk to me. And I, it, I think it starts with that as well, asserting our own value so that... And it has to be collectively, doesn't it, yeah, Roger? Because if you've only got a few people doing that and then you've got the other people that are willing to kind of bend and sway, then it's not going to be as, as productive. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. And um, I, w one of the things that I've mentioned to a couple of the people that I've met um, today, networking, is I spent about 20 odd years as a musician uh, working in, in the industry. It's probably the last two or three years um, I've been on calls with more black people um, than myself uh, on uh, on a business call or anything like that. Um, and I think there's a real big thing about solidarity, working together, um, talking together, joining up, just like we're all, we all are doing um, this afternoon in this room, um, black and white. Um, it's about having conversations um, and standing alongside each other, knowing that other people are out there. Because actually, for me, I literally did spend... Um, all of my time working in orchestras, all of my time working in as a pit musician, all of my time working in studios, all of my time working as a concert um, artist, uh, working with concert artists, literally not seeing any black people. I literally didn't think those people were around. And one of the most amazing things about these kind of experiences is that I actually take a real kind of um, visceral uh, heartening um, experience from being in this space with so many people and finding out, you know, this networking thing is like, I came here today and I was thinking, oh my God, networking, uh, it's Saturday afternoon, I've got to talk to people. But it's just, <laughs> it, uh, it's so lovely to, to, to meet people and talk to people and find out what they're doing and for them, hopefully, to know something about Black Lives in Music, but most importantly for me, just to know that people are out there. So this is an important joined up conversation. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I think one of the most important things to remember is that, you know, I sit alongside these two wonderful young women who are starting their journey in business. I've been doing this for 40 years. But there's real, there is some hope out there. And these young ladies represent that because I started in a business where there were six people working in the music, six black people in the industry. That was it. And I could walk into major companies now and I see black faces. That's a plus. The big thing that I love about this generation is that they won't stand for any shit. They really, they understand what they want. They're prepared to fight for what they want. They value who they are. And they move together as, as, as one. I think Michael might remember, he may know, but I mean, I certainly know when I started in the business, um, we had to bend. We had to, we, had to, we had to be pliable because that was the only way we were going to have a job. These guys don't have to do that now. And I really hope that all of you guys and these young women here today stay together, work as one. And remember that together, collectively, we can make a difference. But as long as there are needs for EDI um, offices and record companies, we've still got a long way to go. Yeah. Okay. As someone that has been in the industry for a while, Adrian, what do you think are some of the sort of historical issues that surrounding race that fuel the issues today that sort of black British executives and artists face and has it changed over the sort of years oh, listen it's definitely changed i mean it, yeah, and that's not to say it's anywhere near where it should be but it's definitely changed i mean i got my first job in the business in god i hate to say this because it actually ages me back in 1983 and i worked at ireland and um as michael know i mean ireland is renowned for its historical love and curation of the culture i think we all agree that blackwall's done a pretty good job but when I started in the business, there were a number of different record companies, not just the three majors you see now. And there was a position these guys may remember called Club Promotions. And Club Promotions was where you'd literally take a bag of records, you'd run around to clubs, and you would hand them out to DJs. And the only black guys that were in the business worked in Club Promotions because we liked to go to clubs. There were six of us. That was it. Every company had one, but that was it. That was... We were the token black people in the business. And, you know, I had a number of years of, you know, for say to myself, pretty decent success. But there was never any chance of me being made a director or an MD or breaking that very, very obvious glass ceiling. And you look at it now, and there's definitely a change. I mean, these guys will see Joe Kentish, um, Darkus, Glyn. I mean, these guys are taking ownership for themselves, but... 
they are the minority. So yes, I mean, listen, it's historical. It's not changing any winner as quickly. It is changing, but we can't be lax and we can't take our foot off the gas. We have to, have to, have to keep working together and keep ensuring that we know who we are. Keep making sure we have ownership of what of our knowledge base, and we and, and collectively, if we work together, we will make a difference. And that you can see that in the way music is now. And let's be brutally honest: if black music wasn't so financially viable, if it wasn't making so much money for majors, I don't think they'd be as interested in having these conversations as they are now. So I'm not sure how Ree feels about that, but you know, that's you know, I certainly feel that way. Do you know what? <clears throat> it's obvious, like. Um it's definitely not six people anymore, but it's like, I think that's one of the only changes. Like, there's still loads of things that, you know, we're still fighting for those manager director things. We're still fighting for, for um, like, high positions, senior positions. And like you said, if, if black music wasn't so viable now, then yeah. But there's a lot of people that have, like, self-started and they've had to create their own in order to get to those positions, which I know that, you know, tech and stuff, things like that have changed. So it's a bit easier in a sense of, you know, there's a way to make your thing pop and, and get like gain traction on its own, doing your own thing, doing something unique. There's like no signal. There's like loads of, that's just one that I'll, I'll like put in spotlight on now. So those of you that, if you don't know it, it's like, it's a radio station that was brought and birthed in the pandemic when there was like loads of people that were obviously all at home in it. So, these two, bro these two brothers, one of which is um, like a G, uh, Jojo, who's like been doing loads of music um, events for the black community anyways. So already had like his own following. And his brother, who's an A&R manager at Ireland. So then they paired together and done this, you know, interactive radio station that online. And from them doing that, that's like helped, you know, a whole scene of people also gain um, visibility for themselves. But to, in order to gain visibility, you, the, the stuff you have to do in order to just, in, instead of just, yeah, like Universal's got an internship, let me apply. It's like, you can't do that. Like, we can do that. It's just the black people that get through that. You probably know someone in the building and I'm happy to see that one change that's been made is there's black nepotism. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. Cause I can say probably for you that that didn't exist. Absolutely didn't yeah. exist. I mean, there well, was still, no culture. There was no collective yeah. culture. People wanting to work together. Even with six black people, we were very separate yeah. as six black that people. That competition, right? I think it was just it's, Semi, it's survival. Yeah. It's yeah. about trying. You know, it's, it's, I'm here. I want to keep my position. And you know, There were many instances where I really needed help and there was nobody that looked like me. There was nobody I could turn to. So you kind of, you have to make your way on your own. And the fact that you guys have now got some kind of system, you know, people you can look to that mirror you, I think it's a great thing because if you need that help, there is someone you can talk to. And, you know, doing the podcast, one of the things that's been clear is having someone that looks like the, you, that you can go and talk to, that you can share experience with, that you can get advice from, is crucial. Absolutely can crucial. Can I, can I just yeah, speak to that? Yeah, exactly. that? That helps, but it's not enough. Yeah. Absolutely not. not enough. Absolutely and, not. And just to put this in, in, into context, um, for me, it's about understanding what you're really up against. And you're up against a perception. A perception that has been around for getting on for 500 years. And it's the most powerful idea on the planet is that black folk are inferior. Now, over that 500-year period, it's been reinforced in science, books, research, to the point where even black folk believe it. But to bring it forward into you know, what we're talking about today, in 2017, I conducted something called the Grime Report. And the Grime Report was looking at the perception um, held by police of young black musicians involved in grime they reenacted a, a bit of law going back into the 18th century, Sus Law, renamed it Form 696, mm. right? And they used this. It was supposed to be for all musicians, but they disproportionately targeted young black musicians, said, yo, give us your phone, right? And then based on the data in their phone, they would decide that that young individual would not perform. The manager of that band was also harassed the club owner was also harassed. The promoter was also harassed by the police with a statement that if you don't comply, 
with what we're saying here, which is that you cannot perform. We will not look kindly on your license or you as an individual. Mm -hmm. Now, I approached Live Nation and Ticketmaster for big data. This is what it's now about. It's big data. And fortunately, they agreed to support. Long story short, with their support, we arrived at a report that was based, the first big data report on black music in the UK. And we were able to substantiate that the perception of grime artists, which were that they were criminals in short, that the money that they had amassed was <laughs> arrived at by criminal means. We were able to show that they were the first entrepreneurs to repeatedly achieve six-figure sums, circumvent the industry that you've just been describing, which is racist, um, championed um, streaming, came up with a new model for marketing and promotion of new music in the UK. So these were entrepreneurs, these were the new business model for the industry, that the industry was some five years behind that they were championing. And we took that report, believe it or not, um, what's the MP, conservative MP that was caught with his hand around some woman? Um, There's a few of those, isn't there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hancock, Hancock. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, take your um, <laughs> but to his credit, he took it into the House of Commons, right? And what's interesting about this story is, at the time, Stormzy had been co-opted into the Labour Party. Um, he didn't champion that. He was co-opted in. They used his success, right? And so the Conservatives had no rebuttal to that, but they took the Grime report and announced that they are championing. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, a decision against the Metropolitan Police. And within three weeks, we got rid of a policy that had been around since so solid. Mm -hmm. We changed London Metropolitan Policing in 2017 and we got rid of the Grime Report. Okay. Uh, got rid of Amazing. Form 696. Amazing. But guess what? His, I feel like history consistently repeats itself in that way because Drill was going through the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, and like here we are again. But I, I mean, I just want to say that like, thank you. Obviously, thank you your generation because obviously you you crawled so that we can run and we can you know so you opening those doors and I, I, th I feel like at a time where things would have been a lot more challenging than it is for us now but I feel like I'm I f I'm very I feel very strongly about um, you know these are facts right but like I said history tends to like it's kind of repeating itself and you know drill is going through the same sort of um, um, challenges Right when when we, we, especially when it comes to uh, not not black music, I feel like black people in general. Like we always have to. I I, I um, was um, this um, I was listening to this thing on YouTube. I came across this clip this clip on YouTube, and it says that if you, um, this lady was speaking, and she was saying that when your skin color is a weapon, you're never unarmed. And I thought that that was a very powerful statement. Um, and it kind of, yeah, so drill is going through the same thing. So I'm very, I'm a very like strong proponent of like, kind of like claiming, claiming your power and using the tools that we're able to use now so that we can't be, you know, oppressed or suppressed in that same way as history has told us. Um, and I feel like if, if, if any, at any time, this is the generation that we're actually able to do that. We have access to information. We have the tools that are ready, readily available to us to do that. And I think that we, we, need to, we really need to take advantage of how the landscape is looking now. Do you know I think, sorry, yeah. can I just say just quickly on your point, it's not drill, it's not grime. It's from, they created a construct called Black Music. Billboard magazine did it when they took blues and made it rhythm and blues so it was palatable to white people. But the crucial thing of you, for me to understand about black music is look at the names. Funk is a smell. Reggae, reggae is the idea. Look, reggae, reggae, something over this. I'll go away with that. That was reggae. Then we had ragamuffin. A ragamuffin is a street urchin. Then we've got grime. Do you understand what I'm saying? Drill. It's where you literally flip that, that script. In anthropology, we call it indirection. You take something and you flip it in another direction. So for me, if we're going to locate what is happening now with the contemporary artists and, and also under the act that um, Michael then got forced or whatever it, that Raga and Dancer was under that as well because those performers couldn't perform either so for me what it is is it's, there's, there's two things going on here one the dominant white society and we need to be very careful because just because somebody 
is black don't mean that they are conscious and just yeah. because someone is white doesn't mean they are unconscious mm -hmm. and sometimes that's why we got to be very careful with the kind of game because for me in the context of knowledge the problem is knowledge has been racialized so the knowers and doers are white mm -hmm. this comes out of the enlightenment we can have this boring conversation another time but the crucial thing is this it's racialized it's gendered and it's classed and only a particular caste and class, generally white middle, upper class people don't business. So white middle class people, they're generally the ones in positions of power when it comes to governance and management. And they know, if you look at it historically, I remember I used to do um, a lecture, I think the first time I did it was in 2002, how black music became urban. Because we used to go in record shops and there were no black music section, it was urban. But under urban was reggae, soul, jazz, funk, <laughs> everything that was yeah. supposedly black music. So I did a lecture on that. And one of the things, were, one of the songs that I got people to think about, you've all heard of the Rolling Stones. They've got a tune called Brown Sugar. Do you know what that tune is about? Anyone? Listen to the lyrics of that tune. It's about a white slave master raping and beating African slaves, women. Listen to the lyrics again. Because I broke this down for people in 2002, and what I said to them is, if the dominant public arena knew what the song actually was, would it get aired? And to me it would, because it's a white band. Let a black band do that about white women. It would have no currency. And this is, this is, so people thought it was a tribute to Marsha Hunt because Mick Jagger had the black girlfriend. But li go back, I just, all of you, go back and listen to Brown Sugar, but the unexpurgated version, because they did another mix of it. That is still as dangerous, but it's not as hot as the original. And then when you listen to that, you will understand the context of so-called black music. Remember that Beatles were a poor, in, uh, were a poor, what were they, um, What's the word? Imitation of the Isley Brothers. That's what the Beatles were. They, they tell you in their own biography. They were trying to play like the Isley Brothers and do some drugged up something and became big and famous. So to me, we, we, we should always historicize. And that's why when Michael says big data, data is what informs us because it has to be researched. If there's rigor, not saying the people in positions of power will listen, but they can't refute. Yeah. And that, for me, is the difference, qualitative difference. Wow. That was interesting, yeah. Exactly. You know, I found it particularly interesting what you said about the words and the way that the music is described, you know, funk, grime, that kind of thing, because words have power. Roger, does, how does black lives and music kind of address the way black music is described and portrayed? Yeah, well, I mean, again, I think a lot of this comes from having um, conversations with artists, with labels, um, so that we can claim this music back for ourselves, so that we can have pride in the music um, that we make, because for so long, and this is something I wanted to, to talk to Adrian um, about for so long, um, we, we've had no real ownership of our own music. Excuse me, of our own music. Um, as Professor Les has, has said, I mean, you know, you want to look for black music, you have to look for another, another um, collective um, descriptive for it because you can't have black music for some reason, um, which is which is nonsense. And obviously, not only that, but I mean, just thinking about what that does to us in terms of our um, own mental health, our own well-being, um, our own self-esteem, our self-confidence, our ability to to negotiate this space um, with uh, agency, which simply doesn't happen. And I think one of the most shocking things about this is we are now in the 21st century. Um, you know, we are supposed to be as a as a human race so so much further down the line um, in in how we conduct ourselves and and have respect for our fellow uh, our, our fellow people, and um, you know we are very much about joining those conversations, bringing people into into spaces, and and I think for example one of the things that came out of our report was um, the issue of um, pay disparity. Which is a real thing, you know, that, and, and uh, um, it's, it's amazing, actually. I've been trying to think about this thing about data and how we deal um, with data and why, why we, why we do, deal with it. And Professor Leslie just kind of summed it up so brilliantly, which is that you just cannot dispute the fact 
it doesn't matter if you don't like it, you just cannot dispute it. So I think there's um, so much about um, the data and how we um, present that, where we present it, who we present it to, how we engage those conversations, um, and how we make sure that we are all represented. So, you know, especially the, the artists. I think one of the things that's really interesting that's come about come out of um, now is looking at um, self-release. And self-release is, is now a device for emancipation in its own in its own way, you know, because we don't have to go through the traditional routes and ask nicely for what we're deserving um just as Josna has said you know i mean this 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 thing about actually we're going to tell you what this costs you know this is going to be done on our terms not not your terms and i think for so long we've been so thankful for that but i'm quite keen to ask adrian about what he's seen in the industry in terms of the pay disparity issue because that is you know that is forensically proven that you oh, know yeah, people absolutely. are coming off a lot worse um, in terms of ethnicity yeah, I mean, and I don't work inside the major label corporation now, but there is no question when you speak to, to the younger generation, they're getting paid significantly less than their white counterparts. There's no doubt about that. So, of equal talent, different colour, different pay scale. And that is something that needs to change. There's no question it needs to change. And... I'm hoping to say look, the guys like Bree and Re and everybody else can actually take that and move it on, but it's it's a mindset, and we have to change that mindset. But we have to make sure that we maintain our value on what what we believe we are worth. But these guys historically have always been that way. When I worked in a label, there were many years I was the most successful A&R man in the building that was earning maybe fifteen, twenty thousand pounds less without any chance of a promotion. So. You guys earning cash, man. Um, I never told you how much I was starting from, though. Did I? That was, a, that, was a, that was the thing. No, seriously, it was, you know, you know as the only black A&R guy in the building, I made sure I earned my money, my, my money every year. Made sure I was successful every year. But knowing I was never going to get as much as the other guys were. Knowing that I was never going to get the promotion that I deserved. So we need to change that narrative. We need to make sure that our people are paid properly, respected in the workplace, given equal opportunity, and have a seat at the table. And we have to demand that. Yeah. That's, that's why it's Mike, important please. to have yeah. like Just organizations. Oh, sorry. We have to demand that. Okay. Um, that's why it's important to have organizations like BLIM, the Black Music Coalition, because we're forcing that transparency, and we're saying, you know, we're not like, taking it, like, lying down anymore. And I think that as, uh, we're talking about, like, executive talent, but as, I think as far as, like, musical talent as well, we need to understand what our Econ like how what our economic power is as like you know um, black artists because we know that there's a disparity in that as well. I know that BMG did like a whole audit reviewing um, you know auditing historical contracts and it was there was a clear gap in terms of like the terms and percentages and and payout amounts that black artists would receive mm -hmm. compared to their white counterparts um, and. It's important to know that, and it comes back to the whole thing about data, because then that means that we're informed and we can, you know, actively um, challenge these things. So yeah, um, very important. <coughs> what I was gonna say about like what you said about like fighting for, you know, the money or not accepting certain things. Like, I'd love to be in that ideal world. Mm. I'd love for it to be that, like, cost of living crisis is, you know, like, we've got mm. energy bills to pay. Good, mm. Like, God knows what that rise is going to be like next month, yeah? Mm. But um, <laughs> but um, we, we still have things to pay for and we still got mm. things to do. And the unfortunately, for a lot of people that work, and I won't even say it's just at major labels, but um, at major labels and probably independent labels as well as management companies, there are so many people that want to do what you're doing and are willing to take the fee that you're not willing to take. So it's very like, I think there needs to be a lot more teaching, um, a lot more support around how to negotiate those things without offending, without trying to talk yourself out of your job, um, without, you know, like putting yourself in a very difficult um position where that's at stake because yeah we want that promotion yeah we can justify it with the things that we've done within our career yeah you know we've got returns that make sense and can justify the pay that we're trying to get yes our appraisals are amazing yes there's nothing that would make them want to fire us but there's also 
a very clear like action of them not wanting to promote or not wanting to unless their hand is forced. So it's, it, that I, I think those conversations are very, very, very difficult when you're at a mid level, especially at entry level, no, I and agree. at mid level I, I to agree. try and, and I, even justify and why you li- should listen. We shouldn't hide behind the fact that they they still have quota systems that they may not want to discuss, they yeah. may not want to tell you about, but are very clearly in play. Mm-hmm. You know, we can see that in the top level executives, the mid range executives, and even the, the entry level where there are only so many black people that are allowed through the door. So the quota level still exists, and believe me, even though it's better than it was when I, was, when I first started, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. But you see, for me, what is crucial about what this young lady here said is it's transparency. Because, for instance, this is endemic to this society. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about music, politics, higher education, which myself and Michael are in, you know, Mikhail, we can tell you categorically how it works. So, for instance, if, if you're... I don't know how it works in music, but what you should do is you can demand your pay scale so you can see where you are on the pay scale. Because what happens to a lot of black academics in HE, they will employ you at the bottom of the pay scale. Then if you get a promotion, you're at the bottom of the pay scale. Then you get another one, you're at the bottom of the pay scale. Whereas they can determine based on your output, your performance, your publications, etc., etc., where you should be. But as a black academic, you will find yourself at the bottom. So that 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 pay scale could be 15 grand between the bottom and the top. So you could have a white colleague who is less competent, less able. I've written an article on this. If anyone wants it, I can send it to our brother Hakim. He will share it. You can, so they can promote you. And let's say you're at point one and there are nine points. They can promote a white colleague and put him in at point seven or her in at point six. That can be £8,000 a year difference. And the higher you go up the scale, the bigger it is. I would say for, prof- for a professorial scale, it might be £30,000, £40,000 between the lowest scale and the top scale. So you can demand from HR what the pay scales are and where you are on it. Unfortunately, that um, like system doesn't really exist in the label sector, and that's something that I want to fight for. Well, to, to be honest, be I have to tell you, I tell you, I know all this because you're talking about. I used to sell my records at the back of my car because me and Deborah Glasgow were the only two non-Saxon people on Greensleeves UK Bubblers label. Peace be upon Sister Debbie G, because she never got the respect out of this country. She did, but. When and, and it's interesting when you talk about bending, come here and tell you the truth, I can't bend. I can't bend, bow or scrape. I'm a qualified plumbing and heating engineer. I'm an industrial pipe fitter and I teach martial arts. And I would go and work in bloody little before I'd bend. I'm 100% serious. I'd sweep the road. I ain't bending or bowing for anyone. And when I went to Greensleeves, I've already written about this. When I went to Greensleeves and I did my first tune and it was doing okay, I think it went top 30 in the reggae chart, whatever, I sat down with Chris Cracknell from Greensleeves. I've written about it, so I don't really care. And he said to me, yeah, Leslie, let's do an album. Went, but, you know, you've got to chat some slackness and rapid rapping. I said, I ain't doing that. I said, I'm not going to talk and do a record that I cannot play to my mother and my young daughter because I had one daughter at the time. Myself and another guy could have got... Michael knows all this stuff. We could have got signed to the same label as Ace of Bass. Remember, yes, I'll be a so-called reggae, like you will be naughty, them there, right? But at the end of the day, when they said to me, oh, you need to do this, I remember one time they said to me, you don't dress like a ragger, DJ. I never used to have lots. I used to cut sevens in my head, kind of mystical thing, you know. But I said to them, I dress the suit myself. But then I'm not marketable. So there are all these other factors that go in. And to put it in a contemporary context, my sole authored books, I self-publish, and I sell them online or at the back of my car. Because no one is going to tell me what I can and cannot say as a person of African ancestry who went through African chattel enslavement Mm -hmm. that is never recognized or acknowledged, in my humble opinion, fully in the wider public arena. As my father said, Minar Ben. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But facts. Yeah, it's, it's yeah facts. those. It's yeah, facts. Facts. it just doesn't exist in a label thing. So I, I wish I want. I'm trying to fight for, like, to have those pay scales and for there to be that transparency across like pay grades and things like that. Because I could tell you, there's a whole like even within. The, um, I'm, I work in A&R, so even within the A&R team in the label that I work for, so I work in Universal Music Catalog, we all get paid different yeah. for different reasons. Yeah. Been in music different, come from different backgrounds, have different skill sets, do, yeah, you like, it's just different. In Ireland, it's different. None of us are paid the same as they're paid, yeah. wow. but the skill set that we have is different than theirs, yeah. so have it's just different to, across... To have a, do you have a colleague who's that kind of like maybe on the same, what well, should be on the same level as you and try to challenge maybe compared to what you guys should be sitting this on is, and bringing that to... Do you know what? It's funny you say this, yeah, because on Monday I actually spoke to one of my colleagues who so I thought, yeah, mm, similar experience, you know, I had time where I was doing something a little bit different and so did they like, yeah, and then I asked them about their pay and I was very similar. Um, his He got a bit more because he'd been in Universal itself longer than longer than me so there's like a bonus that they get and like um a percentage each year that it goes up i think in line with like inflation and stuff so it's a bit different because of how long he's been at the company but um even he even he thought that he was like being paid less than he should and felt quite afraid and he's a white male yeah. he felt quite yeah which which I, which is why i was like what like yeah so um felt quite afraid to like discuss it in his appraisals and when he's talking to the manager in PDPs and one-to-ones and sort of like personal development um, meetings and like one-to-ones with your main manager or line manager. So yeah, it was quite interesting. And I hate that like another layer to it is he was like, we was talking about it and we sit fairly close to each other and there wasn't really anyone like directly close to us as we're discussing this. And he was like whispering it. Yeah. And that is, is that is something I'm like so passionate about changing. Like, why is telling you that I'm on 40k like something secret? A secret. Yeah. Why is that? Why? Why? What? Like, w- what in it? What? Yeah. Like, you know, ask my friends in, who work in NHS. They say they're on pay grade three. They get this amount of money. There's no it's like. Nothing. There's no like. Oh, it's it's uh, 56k. Like it's oh it's oh it's because I moved here. Like why are you whispering? I I was looking at him like is everything are you okay? <laughs> looking around and I felt really like it was. I came into the conversation comfortable and confident. I left the conversation thinking, right, is this a secret? Mean? Like I can't I can't repeat this to anybody. Mm. Definitely told my boyfriend straight after. But like, <laughs> but um, that's not the point. Like I didn't tell. I didn't. I felt like he didn't want me to tell anyone else in our office and I just want that to be removed why is there not that transparency yeah. why are we afraid to say what we're on because they don't want you to like you know uh, sorry I really love DJ Khaled they don't want you to know what the other person is doing they don't want you to win so what you gonna do win like yeah like I don't want it to be no secret I'll tell you what I'm on because I'm like what are you on Yeah. Exactly. like what, are you, what do you get because I should be on what you're on and in fact maybe more because I've done way more than you for this company what do you mean pay me what I'm worth yeah. That conversation. <laughs> no, keep no, for real, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I... Sorry, I think, all right. Michael, oh, no, because I'm just mindful of time. I just wanted to jump on the whole thing about men yeah. and the fact that black men... <clears throat> are employed, well, there's two times more black I women. you're about to say all men cheat, it's true. Well, <laughs> there, is, there is that, that that's another panel, darling. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so apparently there's, it's two to one in the music industry when it comes to black men and black women. And wh- why, why do you think that is? Does anyone have any... I mean, I don't know, Roger, do you have any stats on, on that? In terms I was, I was going to say I do. Okay. Like, yeah, so um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Nadia Khan. She's actually Lethal Bizzle's manager and she runs a platform called Women in Control. Yep. So she, um, in light of... Well, I wouldn't even say in light of 20, like Blackout Tuesday and stuff, because she, she's actually not black, but she was more thinking of it on like women in the industry um, and that's like her main focus. So her report a year on from 2020, in 2021, she said 6% of board members are black women with 11 seats being held on a possible 186 seats. This figure has doubled from 2020 from 3%, which was five seats to 6%, which is 11. There are 0% of CEOs and chairpersons across 11 music trade body boards that are black women. No change from 2020. There are 0% of the lowest representation of black women is 0% on MVT and MPG and UK music boards so these are like more for like I would say 
behind the scenes industry boards. So not your like, um, not your like artists and stuff. It's more like producers and yeah, yeah like uh, com composers and stuff. Yeah, and thirteen percent, the highest representation of Black women is 13% on the PPL board and increased from 0% in 2020. And PPL has elected two black women on a board of 16. So those kind of so those kind of things, yeah, like, how do you say, how do we feel about it, yeah? I was more asking, how do we feel about the fact that women it's different outnumber to men? The, num the men outnumber women. Women, women the, the outnumber the men. There's two, it's two to one. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, that's so that's interesting that's because, before, yeah. Because this is it. There's two, there's two to one in the industry as a whole, right? Roger, back me on this. But wow. when black men get Crazy. to a certain position, when they reach a certain level, then they that's definitely right, yeah. outdo yeah, absolutely. black women. Like, black women can only go so high. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah but there is... Outnumber, not outdo. Sorry, just outnumber. have to... Outnumber. Outnumber. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Is, I meant outnumber. Yeah. Apologies. But, there is a historical precedence to this mm, right. uh, in terms of hierarchy. Mm. It's the white male, then it's the white female, mm. then it's the black male, then and it's then the it's the black female, female if she's lucky, mm. right? Because she then has to benefit from uh, a consideration by that trickle down. And by the time it's got to the black male, it's such a harsh environment that sometimes to look out for the sister just doesn't happen right. and so we have a challenge and if we look at American history because sometimes when we talk about the UK we need to factor in that we're the appendage of um, the American music industry the black coalition in America did this work to begin with that's why we have the black coalition in the UK we did bugger all in the UK mirroring right so let's just put it into perspective and it's historical going back to what Les commented on which was race records we have to go back to that point in the late 50s where most of the white artists in the top of the billboard were covers of black American music, right? It, they recognized that the power lies in the boardroom, right? And in any other industry, the practice within the music industry would be considered criminal. And this is why you talk at a hush, mm -hmm. right? This is why you have a lack of transparency. And in talking to a press agent back in the 80s, um, about, for example, why there's a, a difference in what a black act would get signed for versus a white act. And he said, look, Mike, it's really simple. When you sign a black artist, you prioritize the black community first, and they're small, right? We not, we're not going to invest money to try and break an act uh, into territories that are not even advanced as the UK. And what they were explaining was how multicultural the UK was and how accepting they were of a black artist, black music. So the UK Act, Black Act, was not even getting touring money, was not getting a video money, because they thought there was no point. You're big in the UK, that's enough. We might move you from a single to another single to another single, and then if you're lucky, maybe another single. <laughs> and you might end up with an album, but you will not get an album deal straight off. Now, it's about changing perceptions. That perception from the 80s had carried straight through until it was actually challenged in the 90s and the 2000s by young black artists saying, Do you know what, we ain't going to get a deal, so we might as well find another way through. Dude, so that we need to understand. And in terms of the black male, we haven't written about black women. We don't voice our support for black women. Um, we've not um, studied the music industry as black males, so we're coming into the industry without the knowledge of how the industry actually works. And as I said, and it's really important you understand this, our industry, the music industry, is borderline criminal in its practice, historically and today. And that's why most things happen as a hush, right? And to break that down, it is about education. That's the one word we've not mentioned so far. Yet. I now have <laughs> master's students who are studying, this is black students, studying why they're not in the boardroom. Why is there this disparity, disparity and why is it we don't have access to the data? Yeah. That's mm. education. I'm one of those master students, by the way. So, like, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, that was one thing. Like, I completely like echo and agree with what um, Michael slash Mikel. You, I can say either. Yeah, Michael <laughs> has uh, Michael has said, and um, literally, yeah, 
I was like, okay, so why is there no they your you mentioned um Glyn, you mentioned Joe Kentish, you mentioned Darkus, you didn't mention Alec and Alex, but no, yeah, but also them as well. Where are the black women present? Well, listen, it's one of the crimes. That, yeah, so that's that one there of are, the, there are no black women yeah, present. It is you and, know, and there it's are some horrible. Women. There's some incredibly talented black women yeah. out there. And, and it's it's just one of those things that like when we're there, it's I don't know what it is. It's like they, they think because you're getting black talent in the doors and it's mainly the male artists that are charting or whatever, like the black women does the black woman doesn't have as as uh, much of a relationship with them. Whereas it because we we're not male and black like them. I'm not you know, you asked this, Cheryl, I'm not actually sure why it's a separate fight, but it is and I think it's like um it comes down to a lot of gender norms as well. Um, yeah, like, so being able to fight for, you know, the right pay, um, especially, like, at that level, because we discussed this just before we started, yeah. like, bef before we started networking, and I was saying... Um, Men are, men are taught to be a bit more aggressive with the way they approach certain things. Not that women can't be, it's just it's deemed different, you know. And then we, we wear that hat like, yeah, I'm a black woman. No, I'm, yeah, I'm a woman. Yeah, I'm a black woman. And yeah, and this. And it's like, okay, you're so, you're often afraid of how you're going to be perceived if you was to, um, yeah, perceptions again, like approach a situation that you don't, oh, that's that angry black woman asking to be paid that 10K more. Like, why is, can you listen to why I want the 10K more? Or why I should get it? Re, do you think? So, sorry, just now. Mm. Do you think that the same way there's that perception of black mm. women? Do you think companies are intimidated by black men? Yeah, I do, but I just in a different way. A different yeah. way. I think they feel like if they don't have them there, then they can't have anything. Whereas I don't feel like they feel the same way about black women. I think okay. they think the industry can co can exist, continue to thrive, and everything without the black woman. So that's interesting. That with women, with black women, it's like we're fighting two fights. Right. Do you get what I mean? The we're fighting two and fights. The race. But, but blackness yeah, in general is just criminalized anyway. Yeah. 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 Do you get what I mean? And that's why I found that quote so profound. Like, if your skin color is weaponized, you are never unarmed. And like that, it, it basically for My me, babe. just summarizes just like everything. We've been through a lot, man. A lot. Like, <laughs> we've just been through a lot. A lot. Like it's, it, it actually hurts. Like just to, like just. Just because of like the color of our skin, we're still going through a lot. You know, yeah. just we're still going through and, and and fighting for basic rights by virtue of being a human being. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just want to be hurts. recognized for my work, really. Well, and I don't really crazy. understand that. And I think we even mentioned that, like, why is it... Um, obviously, you know, there's gender differences, like, in terms of creating families. Like, the woman is the one that gets pregnant. And those kind of things. Like, I want to be a mum one day, and I can definitely say I'm in the end of my 20s now. And it's something that I've put off for a very long time. Because I said, you know what? If I'm going to hop to the music, change industries and work in music, boy... I don't know when I'm going to get around to like bringing a bundle of joy into this world because I know the the um like the weight that that comes with it's like oh you're going to be away from this and they're going to see say that you can't do this and then that time out that yeah. you have to raise your child yeah. is like is not the same as a, as um, a man's like now more so and I'm not going to say that every person's co-parenting or parenting situation is the same but the woman has to breastfeed. The woman has to do this. The woman has to do that. And that's, you know, that women get the maternity leave, which is which can be up to a year. In most companies, men get it. And it's what, two weeks, four weeks? A couple weeks. Yeah, a couple, yeah, couple of weeks. If you have a um, cesarean, or like, that's... Do do like, that. yeah, like, that's, that's six why, weeks it, the woman has to heal like, for. It's, it's so exhausting, And the man that don't even cover right? the man's leave. Well, it's so is. exhausting. That's why I'm like, I'm like on my, like, Malcolm X shit. Like, I don't, I'm not going <laughs> to beg for a seat at the table anymore because no. I'm the fucking table. Just make the table. You know, yeah. I'm the fucking table and, and you're just gonna have to get with the program and I feel like that's we're in an um, um, the most empowered position that we've ever been and it's just grasping that with all with both hands but but like everyone has mentioned today I think co collective action is so so important yeah. yeah um and that's how we're going to strive and move forward like I'm, I'm done with begging Sony see my value see my value mm. see my value but collective just make action them, you know, collective and not action. taking your foot off the pedal. collective action Can I, yeah. and mm. just remembering there's a history here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I just put it into context because the project I'm on at the moment is the first national exhibition on black British music. But we're looking at 600 years of the presence of African music and, and impact in the UK, 600 years. So it's understanding that we stand on the shoulders of many people, mm -hmm. right? But also not forgetting, a lot of this has been done before. 
right? And you waste energy reinventing the wheel. Absolutely. We need to do research. We need to get in touch with big data. We need to have a joined up conversation, intergenerational, so I could be yeah. your dad. Yeah. You need to talk to me, right, about what we've done, right? And in terms of the industry, we are powerful, but only if we come together. There was so, one quick thing I wanted to say, and um, something I, I, I hate the word discovered, right? Something I was, re I don't know, what I'm calling it, revealed to me. <laughs> I used to go to this thing called a new music seminar in America because I just wanted to understand the business. So I went, I think it was between 1989 and 1992. I used to go to that. One of the things that I, I that I found out because I reasoned with um, I think it was Chuck D Ice T and someone else, can't remember, I reasoned with them okay, and one of the things that dawned on me about the difference between America and here, and I think that the, the artists here could use that model is, so for instance when Ice T did his album I don't know if it was Cop Killer or whatever, I can't remember, one of his, uh, Home Invasion I think it was, some. Um, it's a nice time. And the, and the, and the um, <laughs> record company refused to promote it. Okay, like a few other artists, I think Ice Cube did it. I know Immortal Technique did it. They basically said bollocks to you because it's college radio that sells records in America. So every university has a campus. And on the campus, they have their own radio station. So they will play music to the campus, so they are not reliant on, like, we would be Radio 1, Capital, whatever. And I remember in, um, I think it was about 19, I think it was about 1987, myself, Smiley Cole, Trasha Senator, Cinderella, Lorna G, we went to do some DJing, supposedly going to clash with some Jamaican artists, big artists at the time, Stitchy, Shinehead. Anyway, some woman shut up the dance in New York, so the dances were done. But... This is the crucial thing. We were in Boston, and I think we did seven interviews in one day across the campuses in Boston to promote the event. And I think that if there's a way that people could use, you know, like out there, the virtual world, to create those kinds of environments, you wouldn't need the record companies. Because that's why, if, you t if any of those old school rappers come in, you ask them, that's why they could, that's why KRS One laughed at Nelly, because I think Nelly sold 200, two, I don't know, two million records and made about 100 grand. KRS One said, I sold 30,000 and made 300 grand, because he sold them for $10 each. And maybe the person you, you could talk to is Eddie Grant, because Eddie Grant was the first person, to my knowledge, who sussed that, which is why he did everything in Barbados, wasn't it? He pressed the music, he recorded it, and he distributed everything. So he was making more money per record than any other artist on the planet. And we're talking what, 60s, 70s, 80s? He was the first to buy back his copyright from the label. So he was the first to buy back his copyright from the label. So there are people out there, that's why I think when Michael says if it's been done historically then let's focus on what is, what is good practice. That's yeah. what I think. So speaking of, I guess, good practice and just looking after each other, mental health. It's yeah, a big thing, absolutely. and I think um, it's a big thing in every industry. So how or, or what kind of things or spaces are in place for protecting the mental health of artists and execs? I think more important, well, not more importantly, but equally executives as well. Do you know what? Um, like, this is more of a new thing, and I would say um, it happened before they literally created it, just before the pandemic. So it's not like in response to Blackout Tuesday, this was like not a byproduct of that. Um, the ladies, Afriye, Shah Grant, and Kamali Scott Jones, and I think now Cheryl's BMC. Yeah, they all three. So they're like in the industry. They work on the new recording side, two of which are A&Rs, and one is a marketing director at EMI Motown, actually under EMI UK. And... Um, they call it the debrief. So it's for black women, black women and women of color in music, 
a place where you can just meet up, meet other black women in music, talk about how your day was. Like, it's just very, it's so, it sounds so simple, yeah, but it's so effective. Like a live Yeah, WhatsApp like, group. just, yeah, and it's just better it not being, like, over WhatsApp. It better, it's better so it I mean, not like being, yeah, like, yeah. It, it being in person, you get, you know, you can cry, you can, you know, you can um, talk about, yeah, like, today was... Mm. I don't want to swear, but yeah, today was whack and, or like, today was rubbish. Like, I never say those two words, but yeah. <laughs> I'm quite colourful with my language, but um, expressive, I call it. Um, and so today was, yeah, it was rubbish and, like, it was rubbish because of this. Like, I felt undermined and speak about your microaggressions and, you know, and, like, it's another place to meet other people in different, like, levels of the industry as well. Like, there's loads of people at entry level. There's also equally loads of people at director and senior level that, you know, you don't get to be in the same rumors uh, so it's quite nice and there's always a spotlight on someone there was one earlier this week for those of you that want to join this as well and be up to, um, like up to date with it just let me know and i'll definitely signpost you to how to be part of that conversation um and amber davis who is the head of a and r at warner chapels publishing and um she gets asked questions again by another black woman working in the music industry to just explain her journey and explain her story and there was way too many relatables there's always way too many relatables yeah. and it's I and that alone is comforting yeah, that's brief, brief. yeah, yeah. Let, me, yeah. let me just bring in another element to yeah. that and respect to that it's what we call a cumulative trauma mm -hmm. um which is a result of being in the music industry i just want to take you back so um for people who've been especially people of color especially black uh, individuals in, in, in the industry and it doesn't really matter where you are but it's acute when you're in Europe or America you have a cumulative trauma as a result of being in the music industry and so I just want to ask a few questions just just to see how where our audience is at mm -hmm. on this very quickly checking the temperature who is this individual okay I'm gonna give you f just five clues has a home in the Caribbean one of the most celebrated musicians from the 70s has had a, um, his biggest hit was I Shot the Sheriff, right? Um, any ideas who this individual is? Eric Clapton. <laughs> <laughs> any advance on that? Did you hear what he said? Eric Clapton. <laughs> Eric Clapton. Now, what is significant about this individual? Is this individual having been recognized as the most successful blues guitarist? His biggest hit was I, Sh I Shot the Sheriff, Bob Marley. Then went on to um, uh, produce the most offensive uh, racist rant, right? The trauma for black individuals was one, this is the king of rhythm and blues, right? This is a guy who's actually, at the time, promoted reggae. He's taken Bob Marley into the spotlight, then comes out and says, I am a racist. And excuse the language, all niggas and packers should go back to where they come from. This is a white man's country, right? And it went on for 20 minutes. On the back of that, and this is where the balance, I think, needs to be struck as well. The white media, white youth came out and said, not in our name. This is rock against racism. The first major march in where we saw British youth who were into the music say, not in our name. And they came out and challenged that. And why I say sometimes we need to go back and understand trauma is when we get to Black Lives in Matter, um, my daughter says to me, yo, you're coming to the march. And I went, I, I've already done that. I did that a while back. And she says, no, you've got to come to this march. And I said, do you know about that march and what it was about? Because we were there as black folk as well, right? And she didn't know, right? And the point is, sometimes we forget. And when we forget, we're at risk of not remembering. And in the UK, we have a complex space in music, which is called gray. It's not black, it's not white, it's just gray. And it's difficult to navigate. Because some of the, sp some of, a major part of the support we need is the community, is the audience that buys black music, right? And it's understand how we negotiate that. And the trauma for artists is when they can't negotiate, when they feel they're on their own, when they feel there's nowhere to turn to, you have to have that hush conversation about how much you're getting paid because you might get fired, right? <laughs> We have to know where our allies are and we have to find them and we have to support them and we have to increase that number. I'm just saying, I keep taking you back. That's my duty as the elder up here, to keep taking you back. There you go. Important. Okay, guys, we've got like four minutes left before we have to jump to a Q&A. So really, really quickly, if we could just get everybody just to, to 
maybe a sentence, just what changes, what changes would you like to see ladies in the music first. industry? OK, let's start with the ladies. Just now. Um, Can you use the mic, please? Oh, sorry. Um, the, the changes I would like to see is, like I said, I think it's just knowing, our, knowing your value and asserting that value. And I think that that's really, really important and it becomes almost crucial. Um, that's the main thing. I wouldn't, it's a change, but I wouldn't necessarily, like, it's, it's a change in a way, but not taking that foot off the pedal, like, making sure however you, well, if you're at entry level, it doesn't matter what level you're at, if you're join, uh, entering the industry, don't be taking scraps, because you're, I feel like I can't say what I'm trying to say without swearing, but yeah, you're fucking up the base for the next, for the next, um, for the next generation, because as soon as you lower that, like, it's, Oh, we can do it now. We can take the piss again. And it's like, as Mikhail keeps bringing us back, it's going to be like, oh, there's going to be another Blackout Tuesday in another 10 years or whenever it ends up. Like, th there's another resurgence of people being outraged. Let's keep it going. Don't stop the conversation from, like, being in rotation. Regularly bring it up. Don't be ashamed to bring it up. It is your birthright to bring it up. But also understand that it's not just, like, I don't, don't want to call it a burden, but we've been, we've inherited this burden. It's not only your burden to bear. So, like, use your community. Tell people around you how important it is to have their support in order to fight this fight for um, recognition, for equality. And, like, it's going to take a long time, but it might, we might not see it. And I've already kind of come to grips with the fact that I might not see it in my generation, as young as I am. I know that I might not. You know what I'm saying? In a, in a, in a, in a decade or so, you know, I might be in his position. And sharing the knowledge. Yeah, sharing the knowledge. And I still might not see it the way that I envisage it. But very idealistic but do not take that foot off the pedal keep the conversations because i'm already seeing some people like who was very enthusiastic about it in 2020 be real silent now yeah. listen that's so, always the way right so that's i'm saying let's not ch like it's already always. changing so let's yeah. bring it back keep it yeah keep yeah. it moving so i was going to say right. just to paraphrase what these wonderful young women said is that value we have to value who we are yeah. remember we are worth something we have a knowledge base yeah. we are people that brings something to the table with everything that we do. It's really important that we don't lower our own bar because as has been said, once we lower the bar or once we open that door, it's very hard to shut. And as Michael said as well, education is key. Absolutely. Education is key. Never, f never forget what's gone before because those journeys can inform where we're going to. So I would say, remember, collectively, individually, we are all worth something. And, you know, I'd like to think that... Listen, I'm not going to see this change. <laughs> there's, there's no question about that. But you guys will. I hope. Okay. But only if you work together. Love that. Michael? Um, keeping it short, knowledge is power. And as uh, Ticketmaster said to me, big data is even more power. And just to put a spin on that, in 2017, they said to me, um, we control Glastonbury because... Uh, uh, Live Nation is our paymasters. Uh, we will tell you who's going to be massive in two years' time. And they said, that's going to be Stormzy. And I went, how do you know that? And he says, well, we've booked him. He's going to lead Glastonbury. It's that simple. Yeah. Knowledge is power. Big data is even more powerful. Thank you, Michael. Professor well, Les? I was going to actually say knowledge is power. But <laughs> it's also you can still it's say also it. the power to make other people feel inferior and stupid. So I always say knowledge gives us the power to liberate or enslave. It's what we do with knowledge yeah. that is crucial. Love that. And uh, Roger? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, uh, I think, first of all, I think it's about the haves, um, giving to the have-nots. So I think Give me. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I, that's the language I got to use, I'm afraid. Um, but I think I think it's about um, grassroots opportunities. I think it's also about um, just coming back to what Ree was saying. I think it's about um, all of these the last couple of years of people um, saying stuff, this is absolutely the time to be doing stuff. Absolutely. And I think it is about positive action. I think it's about structures changing. We just talked about structural racism. 
Um, we know it exists. How do we change that? We need to be positive in our actions, and that has to come through the structures of the um, the organisations that are the gatekeepers and, and the power bases. Love that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. Well, actually, you're not going anywhere yet. We've got 15 minutes for a QA. and a Yeah, sorry, just before we do that, can we just get the socials as well so people can make a note of that? Let's start with you, Adrian. Well, mine's very simple. It's, uh, in fact, I can't remember. Move on. I'll oh. try to remember what it is. <laughs> just now? It's at, my personal is at Diamond Lane London or at Young Music Boss. Reece? Just my name. So, Re underscore Sue L. Michael? Uh, God, there's so many. Uh, easy one. Just <laughs> Base Culture UK at Base Culture UK. Professor Les. At Dr. Les Henry. And Roger. Yeah, I'm a child of an analog age. Sorry. So you don't have an you don't have an Instagram. <laughs> no, I, I th I'm sure we do. I'm sure. <laughs> Black Lives and Music has got an Instagram. Oh, you can you can link everything from the access all areas. Go to the website. Anyway. Yeah. Mine is at decisive management. So. Oh, you find you figured it out. <laughs> you remember. It took a minute. Please don't remember who me what, what was there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we've got about what ten minutes or so for Q and A. Um, is there anybody? Is someone else? So Paolo's out in the. I can't see anything. So if anyone's got a question, Paolo's somewhere with the mic in the audience. Everyone, my name is Kemi Salola. I'm a singer, songwriter, and artist. I'm also part of the um, program with the AAA. Um, my question mainly was, um, how important do you think it is um, for the Black Britons um, in Black music in the UK to connect with Africa and the Caribbean um, a bit more? Obviously, Afrobeats is getting bigger, and there's a lot of potential there. And I feel like until we all can unite together and really build up together, even not even just music aside, just in general, um, I still feel like it's still going to be a glass ceiling until Africa's really where it needs to be. And I feel like if we link together more, we can really bring that, you know, that strength up. So, yeah. Anyone? Anyone want to take that question? I think it is very important because it's like, again, it's like history kind of like repeating itself. We're getting th these colonizers, they're entering. They're entering Africa trying to exploit, trying to build their, you know, their, set the foundation for the exploitation as, you know, Afrobeats continues to fight. And also, we're not monolithic and, and Afrobeats is not the only music form that's coming from Africa that's rising right now. Um, I think it's very important for us, the, 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 the generation coming up to make those connections and to connect the dots and figure out figuring out ways how we can position ourselves to do it ourselves and shape it ourselves and you know I think that's very important and it's something that I'm very focused on at the moment as well actually I'm from Tanzania um, so I've, I've recently been focusing a lot of my energy in, in preparing and, and, and building the infrastructure to, to be ready because I feel like Tanzania specifically is um, has so much talent it's undeniable but we're not ready to compete and I really want to play a part in positioning ourselves to, to, to be in that space. So it is very important. Thank you for that. Let me just respond quickly. Firstly, we're all African. I don't care whether you're pink with purple spots or white or black or brown or refer to yourself as colored. We are all Africans. And your blood <coughs> does not dif uh, discriminate in that way either. In terms of Africans and Caribbeans, that's just the legacy of the colonial system. And if we're not careful, we repeat that. Because what's happening now, the new colonial masters in Africa is the Chinese community, yeah. right? But we have to be careful. As elders, we have to have this intergenerational conversation to say, um, we are connected. We've always been connected. And one of the reasons this project I'm on now starts 600 years ago is because we referred to African musicians 600 years ago as African musicians. It's only post-colonialism that we refer to them as black. No landmass, no culture, no history. No location. No location, Just exactly. Black. So we're all African is the first position. In Europe, you're recognized as black first. They don't say you're from England, you're from the Caribbean, you're from America, you're black first. So get with the program. So for us moving forward, we just have to recognize that, connect and work together collectively, you know, and recognize, again, it's one world. If we want to sell the music we make, we somehow have to still make that connection with everyone else that we have to sell it to. So I would say it's a conversation and just keep the conversation flowing. And it's an intergenerational conversation. But good question. And just to end, like, just after um, both Justna and Michael have said that, one thing that is definitely happening, that's al it's already happening, 
is already happening. I could name two people that are doing it exactly like right now. Tapaneswa is doing it incredibly. Yeah. Shawnee Caballero is doing it amazingly in Jamaica. She's really trying to like bring that, you know, like to strengthen that connection, making sure they're upskilled, making sure they know what um, how to get their royalties and everything like that, and to cross over and build in those relationships. But what's not happening is the community element of it, which is making it seem like it doesn't exist. So there needs to be more people involved in that process. And alongside, say for example, my daily job, like trust when I get home, I go sleep, like I'm tired. So there's other people that may still have energy that could be helping you know carry that load to bridge those gaps and build that community and strengthen it because that's what needs to be happening because it is but in numbers when it needs to be happening like in sorry in in um, speckles but it needs to be happening like at a greater scale and, I just add to that, and also like what i think what becomes very important in this process as well like really just identify who you are what your strength is what your contribution can be and be that person be that go-to person and then start building and building and building and, and recognize i need i need my shawnee to sit I here need to i need my <coughs> and, it's, and then mm. that's how you do it strategically and the time is now like, it has to happen now like these colonizers i'm telling you they are there <laughs> they are there they're, they're moving not going in anywhere. very quickly <laughs> all right can we have another question because we are running really tight for time um michael i believe you talked about the guy from the 70s that was bob marley's um, producer um, and um, I guess I want to talk to you about the um, relationship between um, coming into the industry and um, as black men and um, how do we build relationships with black women in response to the fact that we are black women are outnumbered so black men are outnumbered in the industry two to one as you said I feel like that's like a very small detail that's kind of been like brushed over a little bit. And um, yeah, I want to... Let, let me there. respond to that quickly and I'll move it on. Some of our research uh, in 2018 identified that uh, one of the biggest earners in, in, in the music industry uh, was black women. And it was not for the reasons that most people expected. It was because uh, they... <laughs> Uh, were the carers, they held down jobs, they paid the mortgage or the rent that allowed black males to go out and pretend to be superstars. Um, they took care of the kids um, uh, of the various uh, males and so forth. But over a, pe over the, uh, a period of time, uh, when we look back at earnings, like say every three to five years, black women earned more because they also purchased the records, they went to the concerts, they were the biggest fans. Um, but they also took jobs that um, they, ha they didn't want to take to allow males to have successful careers, right? They didn't earn royalties. They supported that creative output. And so it's one of the unrecognized contributions to black music is the black female. And it's really powerful because uh, without that support, you wouldn't have the black male success in the way it exists. But if you flip that, Black males haven't recognized that support. So that's a major that needs to happen. The industry hasn't recognized that support. Um, so that is something that also needs to happen. I'll hand it over to someone else at this point. Very quick, one record, Midnight Train to Georgia, Gladys Knight and the Pips. Listen to the lyrics. Okay, okay. okay I think we've probably got time for one more question. Or maybe if you make it really quick too. Is it a question or a statement? It's a question, but it's kind of directed to two people, just now and uh, Michael. Okay, cool. Okay, hi, so I'm Sadiq. Um, I work at, as a project manager at Small Green Shoots, which is like an initiative that helps upcoming creatives from disparate backgrounds get into the music industry. Um, which, of course, you talked about you know, being in East Africa, and I'm East African as well, I'm Kenyan Somali, and trying to work in the industry. And of course, you know, back home, the infrastructure not being really intact, but there being such a, you know, it's not a monolithic culture in, the, in Africa, of course, so much. How do you kind of see the importance of diaspora and connecting, of course, like one of the things that I do, I work on No Signal, and it's one of my shows is to kind of help present East African creatives within the UK, particularly, of course, in Kenya and, and Tanzania and whatnot, and trying to bring them, of course, back home and connect them to the, you know, the demographic out there. So how do you kind of navigate that, of course, at your role? And yeah, and then, of course, with Michael, um, of course, you know, with us with Small Green Shoots, I know you're, you're trying to get involved in the documentary you're doing about intergen inter intergenerational relationships between pirate radio and uh, current, you know, community radio, of course, with the No Signals, with the, the Represents, the Balamese, and what's your kind of take on the importance of 
has the spirit of para radio continued in this generation? And do you still feel like, you know, even of course we don't have para radio, we don't necessarily need to put a pose on Oops, Let me just stop you there. It's a long question. It's a long question. Sure. <laughs> apologies. Apologies. Was there two yeah, questions? there was two questions. Yeah, two yeah, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apologies. My, yeah. my answer okay. is going to be quick. It's like it's um, you're saying how important it is. It's it's crucial and it's the lifeline, right? Because we have to take that responsibility of, uh, as a diaspora. I, I feel like my my I feel a very strong responsibility to contribute to the development of my country. How can I do that? For my thing is music education and empowering artist teams, empowering like people from the gr ground up. Um, in terms of like how we can have a proper functional infrastructure where, like I said, we can compete on a global scale and we don't have to wait to, to, to beg or to even be fed false information in order to be exploited. So I want to be that tool and I want to be able to contribute in that way. So it's very important. Okay. And I'll respond quickly. I think there is a natural disconnection that happens with young people and their parents. Late teens, early 20s. We have to recognize that as elders, and young people have to recognize what they're doing as well. And when they move away, they disconnect from uh, a knowledge base. Sometimes that knowledge might be not <laughs> the knowledge they want, but in any event, they're moving away. So we have to recognize this disconnection, and that's just universal. Having recognized that in terms of diaspora, we need to recognize that we were colonized and we are the end result of that subliminal historical bullshit, if you like, and challenge that as elders. But we also have to speak to young people about that experience, and we have to try and reconnect. And anecdotally, it was a couple of students that took me to um, Nigeria uh, to meet an elder. And they said, look, we're trying to do, we're trying to connect with Bahia in Brazil, which is twinned with Lagos uh, in Nigeria. And he says, look, we need to connect with this individual because he was wealthy and he would finance our project in Nigeria. And he says, I'm going to introduce you to him and you're going to talk to him, right? He introduced me to him and the elder said, hello, where are you from? And I went, London. He went, Duh. And he took two steps back. Exactly. Then he took two steps forward again. He says, okay, where are you from? So I thought, got to get my shit together. I went, actually, I'm from Birmingham. <laughs> 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 he took... <laughs> Wrong he walked out the room, right? <laughs> this, the student went, Mike, you're screwing it up, man. We need this guy for the deal. I'm going to bring him back, right? And he brought the, bike, the guy back and he said... Um, the, 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 before he brought him back, the student says, look, um, tell him you're looking for your village, right? Anyway, the elder comes back in the room and he goes, okay, where are you from? And I went, well... Actually, my parents are Jamaican, right? And he looked at me and he said, this is your last chance. And I went, okay, yeah, um, I'm looking for my village. And he went, Dah, we can help you. Wow. And he started to help us, right? And th the story ends with everything was working really fine. And he came back and he said to me, would you like a Nigerian passport? And I said, what would I do with that? <laughs> <laughs> I screwed up the whole deal, right? And the point here is sometimes you think you've lived and you understand only to find out it's a young person that's educating you and we should be open to that. That's how we connect. Thank you, Michael. Unfortunately, that's it. We've got no more time for any more questions, so I'm sorry. But obviously, the panel members will be in the audience, so if there's a question that you have for someone specific, just collar them and ask them and just get interactive. So, once again, just thanks to everybody on the panel. Adrian, Jasna, Ree, Michael, Professor Les, and of course, Roger. That's it. <laughs>